Galatians chapter 3. Let me remind you that in this chapter, the apostle is reminding people that that the law, which came 430 years, the law given to Moses on Mount Sinai, cannot disannul the promise given 430 years earlier to Abraham. Now, here's the earth-shattering statement that he makes in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 7. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. That is an earth-shattering statement. A Jew would argue with that. Even a Muslim would argue with that. I don't know if you've ever heard the term Abrahamic faiths. They say that Islam, Judaism, and Christianity are the Abrahamic faiths. The reason being because the Jews claim their lineage back to Abraham through Isaac, which is true. The Muslims claim their, their lineage back to Abraham through Ishmael, which is is true. And both of them say that, that because they're born into that family, that, that that defines them, identifies them. And then, of course, as followers of Christ, we trace our lineage spiritually back to Abraham. And that's exactly what the Bible says right here. It says, and by the way, the only true children of Abraham are those who are of faith. But to say that a Gentile is a child of Abraham is something that a Jew could not stand for would not stand for. This is part of the reason why they wanted to kill Paul. They, they, they hated him. You are inviting these dogs into the covenant. And uh, Paul said, Amen. <laughs> Amen. Aren't you, aren't you so grateful this morning? Aren't you grateful for Jesus? So, so there's kind of bookends in this chapter, and it has to do with us being children of Abraham. There's the first one right there in Galatians chapter 3, and and uh, <clears throat> verse 7, Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And now if you look at verse 26, it says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Now, now that's it right there. If you are a believer in Jesus, then you are a child of God. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to talk about being an heir of of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Let's read <clears throat> down through verse 12 of chapter 4, starting in Galatians 3 and 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. But is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Howbeit then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them, which by nature are no gods. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, or until ye desire again to be in bondage? Ye observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. Ye have not injured me at all. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we pray for the Holy Spirit's help this morning. And we thank you for the Word of God. We thank you, Lord, that you are present with us here this morning and that we can understand the Bible with the Spirit's help. And so that's what we pray for this morning, Lord. Thank you for this time together in Jesus' name. Amen. First thing I want you to see is our acceptance in Christ. Our acceptance in Christ. There, in the, the last part of chapter 3, he says, "...you are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus." 
not of works, not of rituals, not of law keeping, not because of anything that you've done. If you have faith in Christ, then you are a child of God. John says something very similar in John chapter 1 and, and verse 12. He says there, <clears throat> But as many as received him, that, that's Jesus, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that, were, that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You see, you're, you're a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ. You're not a child of God because you were born into a particular family. You're not a child of God because you are of a particular race. You are not a child of God. Here's the deal. God doesn't have stepchildren, and he doesn't have grandchildren. You understand? God only has children. And you become a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ. So he goes on to say in verse 20, 27, For as many of you as have, put, as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now, what he's talking about ultimately is spirit baptism, but, but water baptism is actually a picture of this. It is a, a demonstration of this. When you get saved, you are placed in Christ. This is a spiritual transaction that takes place. It's not something you can see. It's part of the reason why we practice water baptism is to say, hey, this has already happened to me. I got saved and, they, and it put me in Christ. And the old Roddy, he's dead. And we're going to bury him. And this new Roddy that's, gonna, that's been uh, given life through faith in Jesus Christ, he's going to rise up out of the grave. And so we take him in that watery grave and we put them under. They're dead. And we bring them up. And it's a picture of this being baptized into Christ. It's a picture of something that you can't see that happens spiritually. And that, that's what he's saying. He's saying, look, if, if you have faith in Christ, you are a child of God. You are, you are something totally new. And here's what happens. We do away with all of those old distinctions in Christ. This is an earth-shattering statement. Now, as I read this, I want you to think about who's saying this. A Jewish man. Okay? A Jewish man. So he says there in verse 27, As many of you have, put on, have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. Once Christ came, all of those distinctions, they are not important anymore. The Jews are no longer closer to God. The Greeks are no longer alienated from God. Once you come to Christ in the church, once you've been baptized into Christ, all of those old distinctions, they don't matter anymore. There is neither bond nor free. You know, when Paul meets a centurion in the book of Acts, and the centurion, they're going to they're gonna whip Paul and his traveling partner. And he says, hey boys, he says, I don't think you can whoop a citizen without a trial. And they said, wait a minute, you're a citizen? Because you see, in the day that Paul lived, about two-thirds of the people that lived inside the confines of the Roman Empire were slaves. About two-thirds, they say. Well, Paul's not a slave. He's a citizen. He's a free man. And this centurion looks at him and he's surprised. He said, you're a Jew and you're free? He's like... I purchased my freedom at great cost. I saved for years. Paul says, I was freeborn. And, and he, was, he was surprised by this. So as Paul says this, a vast majority of the people who are going to be reading this are not free. They are servants. They are slaves. They are the property of the people that they work for. You've always got to remember that as you read your New Testament. By the way, Paul didn't say that they needed to rise up. He didn't call for reparations. He, he didn't say that they needed a revolt against, against the, the, the government. No, as a matter of fact, as you continue to read and as we've looked at in Colossians and other places, Paul told servants to treat their masters right to serve them as if they were serving Christ. He says, yeah, if you can get your freedom, do it, but it's not worth fighting for. Just serve your master like you serve Christ. Earth shattering. Earth shattering. Look at the world we live in today. Our 
elected leaders are trying their very best to tear this country apart with racism. And yet, in Christ, racism goes away. There's neither Jew nor, nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. Now, don't take that the wrong way. He's not doing away with gender differences. What he's talking about is our standing before God. Is a woman any farther away from God than a man? So this week I was praying about that and thinking about that. So I, I, I went back and I did a little bit of research. The Mormons, the LDS, they teach that one of the reasons that they push marriage so much is because a woman is going to be called out of the grave at the resurrection by her husband. And the only way that a man can get into the celestial kingdom, see the Mormons have the telestial kingdom, the terrestrial kingdom, and the celestial kingdom. All made up, none of that exists. But this is what they're taught, this is what they believe. They teach that the only way that a man can get into the celestial kingdom is if he's got a good marriage with a good woman. And the only way that she can get into the celestial kingdom is if she's in good graces with her husband because he's going to be the one who calls her up whenever this happens. Now, if that makes your stomach churn, good. By the way, Mormons also seal marriage for time and eternity. And Jesus says marriage is for time only, till death do you part. Don't give in marriage or have it. Marriage in heaven is, it doesn't, it's not the same. It is not what we do here on earth. And Mormons teach this. Why do they teach this? Because they teach that a good Mormon man is going to become a god. He's going to have his own planet. He's going to have all these women that are his wives. And through all of this celestial sex, they're going to populate their own planet just like the god of this one did. That's what they teach. That's what they believe. Isn't it amazing that they read this book right here that says, in our standing before God, my wife and I stand on level ground. What does that mean? It means that she's saved the same way that I'm saved. My daughters, how are they saved? Same way that I'm saved. Am I any closer to God because I'm a man? No way. Did you know that in places, in, 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 in different teachings within Judaism, that there were Jewish men who would pray, Oh, thank you, God, that you didn't make me a woman? <laughs> Why would they say that? Because they look down on women. It's amazing to me to see, and you should study this, by the way, if you're a young lady or an older lady, and you kind of lean toward feminism a little bit, you should do a study sometime and just see how freeing Christianity has been to women worldwide. And you should look at the Muslim world. Did you know that in a Muslim court, a woman's testimony weighs less than a man's testimony? As much as 25 to 50% less? Now, do, do we believe that? Of course not. Matter of fact, I'm pretty sure a woman's testimony is probably closer to the truth than a man's because she probably can remember what happened better. Anyway, I don't know. But, but look what Paul is saying. He says, a Jewish man who's free, like him, doesn't have a better shot at God than a Gentile woman who's a slave. You see, you take a Gentile woman who's a slave and you put her, she's in a lower category even in the Roman world that he lives in. And he says, no, 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 no. All of those distinctions are gone in Christ. When we come together as brothers and sisters in Christ, our standing before God, we stand on level ground. Now, I'll tell you something else that this doesn't mean. The same guy who wrote this was also inspired by the Holy Spirit to write that the husband is the head of the wife and that he did not suffer a woman to teach or to usurp authority over the man. So, does this mean, because of this verse, that women should be pastors? No, of course not. The Bible says that she shouldn't. The Bible says the man is the head of his house. We're not talking about roles here. We're talking about standing before God. And that's what he's saying. You are all children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter where you came from. 
doesn't matter what color your skin is. Doesn't matter what your race is, what your background is. Doesn't matter whether you're a slave or whether you're free. Doesn't matter whether you're educated or uneducated. Doesn't make any difference. None of that makes any difference. It's why we take the gospel to every man, every woman, every boy and every girl. And we share the gospel the same with every single one. If you will repent and trust in Christ, you may be saved. Amen. Amen. And so, so as many as you have, put on, have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek, neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. This is the problem that I have right now with the, the woke church that's buying into the whole systematic racism business that's going on in our country. Listen, stop it. Stop it. Racism is wrong at any level. And especially if you're a follower of Jesus. But at the same time, turning the cart over and, and kissing somebody's feet is wrong as well. That's ridiculous. That, that is, these reparations and all this kind of stuff. Well, good grief, how far back are we going to go? What, what, what are we going to do? Listen, stop worrying about all of that stuff and let's talk about today. Let's live today right here in today and let's treat people the way that they're supposed to be treated right now let's do what's right right now let's love people doesn't matter what their background is doesn't matter what color they are doesn't make any difference where what their their socioeconomic status is amen and so so he goes on and he says you're all one in christ jesus and if you be christ's if you belong to him, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise? Oh my goodness. That takes us all the way back to Genesis, doesn't it? That takes us back to the promise that Abraham was given. Now, here's the thing. You say, well, does that mean that, that we inherit the nation of Israel? Listen to me. Abraham was looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. Abraham never claimed one inch of that land, ever. He pitched a tent. Now, do the Israelite people, do they, is that land theirs? Sure. But as being heirs of Abraham's, we inherit the earth. The meek shall inherit the earth. It's all going to belong to God and to his children. Amen? And so, so the next thing I want you to see is when we talk about being an heir, we're talking about being adopted in Christ. We're talking about being adopted in Christ. Now here's the thing, the Bible uses both metaphors. It says that you must be born again, and it uses the metaphor of adoption. It's actually not a metaphor, it is a reality, both of them are realities, but we can understand these. We know uh, a, a child that, that his biological mother gives birth to him, he is he's born by his mother. Well, Jesus said you must be born again. And here we're going to talk about adoption. So he says, now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. Now this is tying back into uh, chapter 3 where he says, in verse 24, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. So think about a, a child who is heir to a vast fortune. But while they're still a child, their father takes them, their mother takes them, and puts them under the tutorage of a schoolmaster, someone who's going to take care of them, make sure they get to school on time, make sure they get their studies done, make sure they're fed and clothed and attend the things that they're supposed to attend to because dad's busy, mom's busy, whatever. Wealthy family situation is the illustration here. But what he says is, and, and it makes sense, and I, I have a friend, he was heir to a vast fortune, but it didn't kick in until he was a certain age. And so when he was younger, when he was in his teens, he did not have access to that checking account for the corporation. He was no different than the hired hands that worked for his granddad. But when he turned, I don't remember, maybe 21, I can't remember what the age was, 25, whatever it was. When he turned that age, he became the owner. He went from being the heir to the owner of everything at a certain time. Well, that's what he says. He says, he says, the heir, as long as he's a child, different nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Can you see, and we looked at this last week, all of these timing things, until, until the time, right? 
And, and he, what he's, what's he bringing us to? He's saying that when Jesus came, everything changed. So important. When Jesus came, everything changed. Verse 3. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Okay, that word elements, and I won't be able to say it right, but it's, it's stochia, stoichiometry. Anybody know about stoichiometry? Raise your hand. Katie, raise your hand. You know about sto- Raise your Matthew, you know about stoichiometry. Raise your hand. I know about stoichiometry. Who knows what stoichiometry is? Stoichiometry is when you figure out atomic units, Avogadro's number, moles, amen? If I add this much calcium carbonate to this much water, I'm going to have this many moles of this and this, and we balance equations. It's magnificent. Please, someone raise your hand. Who loves chemistry? There's got to be one person here who loves chemistry. Well, anyway, y'all need to repent. Chemistry is awesome. Stoichiometry is the study of the elements. Anybody know what an elemental chart is? Yeah, there you go. It's that funny thing with all the little boxes. Looks like Legos stacked up, different colors. Starts with H over here and winds up with the rare earth metals or something. Right? Those are the elements. Those are the building blocks of everything around, including you. Hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, helium, that stuff, right? Well, those are the elements. All right. What he is saying here in using that word elements from which we get the Greek word behind that is this stoichia whatever word from which we get our word stoichiometry or the study of the elements is he's saying that these things are the building blocks. So you are made up of amino acids that form proteins, that form muscles. And those amino acids are made up of molecules, and those molecules are made up of those little elements. And there's about six elements that make up about 98% of you. And so if we were to burn you up and reduce you down, you're mostly water and carbon and a few other things, right? Same thing that we find in the dirt. God said he made Adam out of dirt. You're made out of dirt, okay? And so, so what Paul is saying is he says... When we were children, we were held in bondage under the elements. The elements are the building blocks. They're the ABCs. I want you to think about a a book. Think about the Bible. The Bible is made up of chapters, paragraphs, which are made up of sentences, which are made up of words, which are made up of, in our language, 26 building blocks. 26 elemental ABCs, right? So we got 10 numbers, and you can make any number out of those 10. And we got 26 letters, and you can make any word, any sentence, any paragraph, any essay, any book out of those 26 letters. Hebrew has less. Greek has more, okay? Did you understand what I'm saying when we talk about the elements? What Paul is using the word elements to describe is, is the old covenant system. He says, you were held in bondage under the old covenant system until the time that Christ came. Verse 4, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. He came in the flesh. He was made of a woman. He is a Jewish man on his mother's side. He was born under the law. He lived under the law. He was circumcised the eighth day. He, he had, uh, Mary went and she made a sacrifice for Jesus. They offered turtle doves uh, whenever he was born because that was the sacrifice that a woman had to make. And then she remained impure for a certain amount of time after having that child. All of that. Jesus was, was born in that, in his flesh, okay? And so, so he's saying that when that happened, we go on from the ABCs and one, two, threes. We go on from kindergarten and we begin to graduate into the New Testament. Verse 5, he was born in the fullness of time to redeem them that were under the law, to purchase them, to buy them back that we might receive the adoption of sons. So can you see the illustration? <clears throat> the law 
was a schoolmaster. The Israelites never entered into, and the Greeks who believed in God, and the barbarians who believed in God, anyone who believed in God, was held under that law from the time of Moses until the time of Jesus. And it, it was a, a schoolmaster because they weren't ready yet. It wasn't time to receive. Although they were going to be heirs, not all of them, but those of them who believed, they weren't going to receive that inheritance until the time had come. And by the way, when do you receive an inheritance? Only when the person that you're inheriting from dies. And so at the time of the death of Jesus, then this kicks in and the New Testament begins. You've got a, a period of time there that you, you have to wait until the Holy Spirit comes and then bam, the church is born on the day of Pentecost. And so what, what, he's, what he's helping us to understand here is, is he says, look, <clears throat> at that moment, you went from being held by the ABCs and 123s, the elemental things, the law, to entering into the full privileges of an adult adopted son. Now, what is that? Well, I've explained this a little bit before, but one of the things that feminists get upset with is it says the adoption of sons. And they're like, and daughters. Well, don't say that because you don't want that. Here's why. Because in the Roman world, an adopted son had full privileges and could never be disowned. So what you did was, was you had a son, it was your biological child, and you watched this child grow up, you put him under a tutor, and he goes off and he wastes everything, and he will not obey you, and you look at him and you say, man, there's no way I'm handing my fortune to this kid. You could actually disown that kid. But when you adopt a child in the Roman world, and adopt a, a son, they have full inheritance privileges, and you can never disown them. And so the illustration that he's using is of that. So when the time comes, he's re he redeems those who are under the law that we might receive this adoption, this guarantee of the inheritance, this stamp of approval by the Father that we get everything that comes from the Father, the entire inheritance to us. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of His Son, into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. The Holy Spirit, the, the seal of our inheritance is given to us. At our house the other day, we were talking about this. How do you know that you're saved? Well, this is one of the ways that you know that you're saved. You have an anointing, an unction. The Holy Spirit lives in you. And you have this, this, this change in your heart where you recognize God as Father when you literally cry out to Him as Father. This happens in prayer. This happens in just the realization that, that you belong to God because you trust in Christ. And so he says in verse 7, Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Can you see that? No more a servant, but a son. And if you're a son, then you're an heir. And what do heirs do? They inherit. And how much does our big brother own? Everything. <laughs> Everything. He made the elements. He made the sun. He made the moon. He made the stars. We inherit along with him. We are children of the Father. That is just incredible, is it not? This is the family that we are adopted into. Now, with all of that said... I have, to, I have to stop. This is really interesting to me. And, and God bless you, YouTube. <laughs> I post all of these on YouTube. If you miss a Sunday, God forbid, and you need to catch up, you can find them. They're, they're on there. Unless every now and then I have technical difficulties. But I put all these on YouTube. Well, on YouTube, I, they're just public. And I left the comments on. Maybe I should turn the comments off. What I'm hoping for is that, that you know, people might get saved. But sometimes that happens. But most of the time, no, no, sometimes there's, there's comments that are, you know, less than positive. But here's what was really interesting. This week I received a comment about last week's message. And it said this. It said, there is no Gentile that was ever under the law. Therefore, 
Christ couldn't redeem you from the law. You were not under the curse of the law as a Gentile. That was only for Israel. And as a Gentile, you were not considered under the law. Therefore, Christ can't redeem you or become a curse for you. And that's why Christianity is false. And I thought, you know, that is a, that is a great question. It, it is. I didn't address that last week. I need to. How do we know who's Paul writing to? Who are the Galatians? Well, they're Jew and Gentile. He's got both, but primarily Gentile. There's a few Jews that are amongst these, but primarily Gentile. So in all of this illustration, why would he go into it that deep if it didn't apply? And so my comment to the person was, read Romans 2 and 3. So turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Romans 2, and let me show you. Let me show you the way that God views this. <clears throat> Does the law affect the Gentile world? Yes. Not the ritual law and not the ceremonial law, but the moral law of God. And by the way, the moral law of God has not changed. The moral law of God is older than Moses. It's always been wrong to commit adultery. It's always been wrong to murder. It's always been wrong to steal. It's always been wrong to dishonor your mother and your father. Those things have always been wrong, and they always will be wrong. Does God hold the Gentile nations to that standard? You better believe it. And watch how Romans tells us this in chapter 2. He says in verse 14. He said, let's read verse 13. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. It doesn't matter whether you have the law or not. If you're going to be justified by the law, you have to keep the law. Okay? Verse 14, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, this was the person's question. Hey, these Gentiles, they've never been under the law. So how can Christ become a curse for them? So Paul answers that here. When the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law. Listen, I don't care where you go in this world you're going to find that stealing is wrong. In Chop Chop Square in Saudi Arabia, if you steal, they will cut your hand off. And when they find somebody who only has one hand, they know he's already been stealing before, and then they'll go ahead and cut your head off. Stealing is wrong. Everybody knows stealing is wrong. Why do we know stealing is wrong? Look at verse 14. When the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law... These having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts. This is the moral law of God. Their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. Your conscience is something that you have whether you're lost or saved. Lost people have a conscience. Saved people have a conscience. Did you know that, that amongst gang members, there are rules? Did you know that? MS-13 gang members may come up here and murder people. But it's wrong for an MS-13 gang member to murder another MS-13 gang member. Did you know that? Wonder where that came from. Wonder where these codes of conduct come from. They come from the conscience. Now, the conscience can be messed up. It can be perverted. It can have all kinds of problems with it. But ultimately, God has written the, the moral law in the heart of man. When you come into this world, you know what's right. and You know what's wrong. And then if you'll turn over to Romans chapter 3 and verse 20, it says there, I'm, I'm sorry, verse 19, it says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law. Now, that's the question that the person had for me. They said, the law can't say anything to the Gentiles. They weren't under it. But look at this verse in verse 19 here. It says, we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped. How many mouths are stopped by the law? Every mouth and all the world may be guilty before God. You see, the Gentile world may not have had that law given on Sinai, 
But they had that moral law in their heart given to them by God from creation in their conscience. And listen to me. You want to know why the suicide rate is so high in our world? Because of guilt over breaking God's law and knowing it. The homosexual world knows what they're doing is wrong. They're trying everything they can to quench the conscience, squelch the conscience. It's why they want to push so hard to pass laws that you can't say anything about their lifestyle because they feel guilty. Why do they feel guilty? Because they are. A thief is guilty and they know it. A murderer is guilty and they know it. Ladies who have had abortions deal with that. They can sit there all they want to and say, well, I'm in a state that I'm in a red state. I'm in a blue state. I'm in a state that does this or that. They can say that all they want to. At the end of the day, God put a conscience inside of them saying, that is murder and you know it and you know it's wrong. And they can try and they do try everything they can to quiet that conscience. But listen to me, there is nothing in this world, there is nothing in you. There is no psychologist. There is no self-help procedure. There is no political party that can deal with your conscience except God. And I'm going to show you that in just a minute. So let's go back to Galatians. He talks about, he, he, says, he says, we are accepted in Christ and the, the ground at the foot of the cross is even. It's level in Jesus. Number two, we are adopted in Christ. And now Paul's plea to these Galatians is, is since you are accepted, and it's not based on men or women or bond or free or Jew or Greek, think about, think about the, the, the old covenant and you being a slave woman who is a Greek and wanting to worship God. Could you? You could. But you couldn't come all the way in. Because only a man could come all the way. He could come right up to the altar. He couldn't go past that. It took a priest to go past that. And even he couldn't even go into the Holy of Holies. It took the high priest. And even then, he could only do it one day in the year. If you had been a, a, a woman who was a Gentile and who was a slave in the Old Covenant and you wanted to worship the one true God, you could have come to the court of the women and that's as close to God's place his place of worship as you could get. That's it. And when Jesus died on that cross, he ripped that veil in two from the top to the bottom. And all of those distinctions were gone, just like that. And you ladies can come right into the very throne room of God, come right to the mercy seat. What is the, the top of the ark called? It's called the mercy seat. And what does Hebrews 4 tell you that you can do? You can boldly come to the mercy seat of God to find grace and mercy to help you in your time of need. Doesn't matter what your background is. Why? Because we're adopted. We are heirs. We're adopted through faith in Christ. We have full access to the Father. We have all of these things because of our law keeping? No. Because of our faith in Christ. And so Paul brings us to this point here and he says, you're accepted in Christ, you're adopted in Christ, therefore advance and don't retreat. And that's what Paul sees going back in the law. He sees it as a retreat. Look with me at verse 8. He says, how be it then when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. He's talking to idolaters here. Most of the people he's talking to came out of idolatry. This Greek, Roman, Norse, Germanic, uh, whatever, whatever kind of idolatry they came out of. Most of them had come out, he said, those things that you used to do service to were not gods. You thought they were, you were taught they were, you were told they were, but they weren't. Why would you go back to that? Would you, once you've heard the truth of Christ, once you've believed on Him, would you then turn around and go back and worship Aphrodite or, or Zeus or Apollo or... No, of course not. That would be foolish. You, you, you realize that all of that is, is a lie. Why would you go back to that? Verse 9, But now, after that ye have known God... And then there's this little parenthesis here. Or rather, are known of God. <laughs> Isn't that fantastic? Who's President of the United States? Joe Biden. You know him? 
does he know you? Do, do you think there's a chance that he could know you? You might get to meet him. This illustration probably worked better three years ago, didn't it? Rock star Obama. Man, people wanted to shake his hand, you know. How many of all those people that he shook hands with do you think he actually knows? Right? But do you, do you see what that verse says? It says, it says, when you hear the gospel, now you know God. And he knows you. He knows your name. He knows how many hairs are on your head or how many used to be. He knows everything about you. He knows you intimately, inside and out. He knows you and knows everything about you. We have entered into a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. And so he says, but now, can you see once again a timing? Until now, everything has changed in Christ. After that you have known God or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage. This is the kind of stuff that got Paul stoned right here. He talks about these elements again. We talked about that, the stokia, stoichiometry. I'm going to use that one. It's not stoichiometry, but it's the Greek word that's the base root of that. It's the building blocks. He says, the old covenant was a schoolmaster. It was for children. It was a, a, a schoolyard watchman to keep you from running out in the street, to make sure you went back to class on time, to get you into the lunchroom, out of the lunchroom, and show you where the bathroom was, to make sure you got on the right bus after school to go home, made sure you weren't playing hooky, hanging out in the gym on the stage in the little theater. Don't ask me how I know. He says, but now you've been adopted. Now you're grown. Now you've entered into, because of the coming of Christ, a, a new time has come. Once you've graduated with a PhD, there's only one reason to go back to kindergarten, and that is to teach kindergartners. It's the, it's the only reason. You would never, ever go back into the elemental things once you have been here. So he, what he's saying is, is once you've known Christ, why would you go back and listen to these adjectives that he uses? Weak and beggarly elements. He's talking about the law here. Now, be careful because Paul is not ever going to say that God's law is a bad thing. That's not what he's saying. The problem with the law, of course, is man's flesh. But what he's saying is, is the law is weak. It is powerless. And he's saying the law is beggarly. It is unprofitable. And here's why. It's just like the law in the world that you live in today. How many of you have been reformed because you got a speeding ticket? How many of you, your foot changed from lead to a nice balsa wood? after you got that speeding ticket? No, the, the law, well, me too, because I'm cheap, right? I hate having to pay. I mean, I, but I'm not reformed. I still, it still aggravates me to no end, right? Especially going to New Mexico. Man, I, I love my home state, but I'm here to tell you, what a messed up place. You're driving along, you're on this nice Texas road, running 75 miles an hour, and here comes that yellow sign, the land of entrapment. And all of a sudden it goes, boom, 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 and bam, 65 miles an hour, just like that. I'm like, what's up with this, right? That law has not fixed me. It has not changed me, and, 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 it's, and it's never going to. The, the law can't change my heart. It can't make me good. It can't make me better. And so what Paul is saying is, is he's saying, look, why would you go back under that? It's weak. It's powerless to do any good for you. And it's beggarly. It's useless. It's not profitable to you. All the law keeping in the world can't make you better. It can't make you right. <clears throat> the only thing that it could do, possibly, is keep you from dying by obeying it. That's it. That's the only thing that it can do. But it can't give you life. And I'm talking about dying physically. Because if you break the law, you're dead, right? That's the, way, that's the way that worked. 
Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Hebrews, chapter 9. The writer to the Hebrews, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says something real similar to this. Hebrews chapter 9 and beginning in verse 9. He says, <clears throat> he's, 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 he's talked about the tabernacle and all of its furnishings up to this point. And he says, which was a figure. That temple, that tabernacle, it was a figure. It was a, it was a type. For the time then present. Once again, get ready for the timing words. It was a type for the time then present. In which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect or complete. Those sacrifices could not. They were weak and they were beggarly. As pertaining to the conscience. There it is. Here's the thing that law can never do. Law can never fix your conscience. If you broke the law, your conscience tells you you broke the law and nothing can ever change that. You, you know that, it, that you did it. And so that Old Testament saint who brings his, his animal and, and that animal is brought and he lays his hand on the head of that animal and he confesses his sin and that priest takes a knife and cuts that animal's throat and bleeds that animal out and they gut that animal and skin that animal and take the pieces of that animal and cut them up and burn them up on that fire and the whole time that man is standing there going, I know that I'm okay with God now because of this, but I still feel guilty because I still broke the law. I still know what I did. I know that tonight when I lay down on my bed, I know I'm going to have the same thoughts I had. Listen to me. I just had a conversation with someone just a few weeks ago, and they told me, they said, you know, they said, they were talk, we were talking about adultery, and they said, they said you know, I, I know that that Jesus said that to look at a woman with lust is adultery. He said, but, you know, I, I just kind of got to where I don't even pay attention to that because I know I'm going to do it anyway. And I, I mean, it was kind of shocking. I appreciated the honesty, but at the same time, I'm, I'm like, but what you're saying is, is there's no tools to deal with that, and there are. There are tools to deal with it. But those tools are not fleshly. It's not law. Law won't fix that. I mean, you can say naughty, naughty, and you can spank someone's hand with a ruler all you want to, and you can kill all the animals in the world you want to to make up for it, but you still haven't dealt with the conscience. Because in the heart, and what he was telling me is, is he's saying, my conscience is pricked. I do this, I know I shouldn't do this, and my conscience is, is getting me. And I've gotten to the point where I feel bad because I know I'm going to do it again. So what do we do? How do we deal with this? Do we add law? No. Law can't fix it. Because law can't fix your conscience. But watch what Hebrew says here. He says, he says uh, the person who, who, who brought those gifts and sacrifices, verse 9, that could not make him that did the service perfect or complete as pertaining to the conscience which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. See that? Until. Those things were imposed upon them until the time of reformation. What's that? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the time of reformation. But Christ, being come an high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God, the only thing that can cleanse your conscience is the blood of Jesus Christ. But the good news is, is he can cleanse your conscience. Listen to me. If you have the, the, whatever the temptation is that you face and whatever sin it is that you deal with, 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ died on the cross and he shed his blood to pay for that. And then it wasn't like some dead animal that just died. Then he turned around and gave you his spirit to live in you. Listen, you can have victory over the flesh, 
But you're not going to do it with the flesh. You're going to have victory with spiritual weapons, spiritual tools. That's how it's going to happen. So Paul is saying here in Galatians 4, he says, why after you've known God or rather are known by God, why would you turn around and go back to these weak and beggarly things <clears throat> and, and, and where until you desire again to be in bondage? All that stuff can do is put you in bondage. Why would you go back to the Old Testament law? Why would you go back to offering animal sacrifices? Why would you go back to observing a particular day of the year? You observe days and months and times and years. Why? What good is that going to do you? What's he talking about? He's talking about new moons. He's talking about Sabbath days. He's talking about Passover. He's talking about tabernacles. He's talking about all of the observances from the Old Covenant. Now, don't hear what I'm not saying. A Jewish person who still celebrates those particular days because it's part of their heritage and they want to celebrate them with Christ as the center, which lots of redeemed Jews do, whatever, great. But it ain't going to make you any closer to God. It's not going to make you any more spiritual. Listen, folks, this is dealing with the Seventh-day Adventists. This is dealing with the Hebrew Roots Movement. This is dealing with your friends right now who are telling you that you're here on the wrong day. You should have done this all yesterday. Paul says, I am afraid of you. I'm scared. If you're still caught up in this, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. Paul says, if you still don't understand that, in other words, I didn't preach the gospel to you Gentiles to turn you into Jews. I preached the gospel to Jews and Gentiles to turn you into children of God. And that's all the difference in the world. He says, brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. You have not injured me at all. In other words, Paul's saying, look, I'm an I'm I'm example for you. Watch me as I follow Christ. Imitate me. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. This was Paul's mode of operation. This was his way that he operated. He went into a town. The first thing he did was go to the synagogue. He offered the gospel to the Jews. Most of the time that lasted from a week or two to three or four, and then they ran him out because he went ahead and said something like, now, why would you go back to weak and beggarly elements? And they, they just couldn't take it. I mean, their entire, their entire heritage, their tradition, all of these things, right? And you just called all of that weak and beggarly? Yeah, they don't, they don't take well to that. Uh, no religious person does. <laughs> all the trappings, all the stuff. All of those are weak when it comes to dealing with sin. Be it's beggarly when it comes to dealing with righteousness. Religion can't save you. Religion can't sanctify you. Religion can't make you right. All of the fleshly stuff. I, I, I read a deal the other day about a guy, and, and he, he wore this band on his leg that was a leather strap around his thigh that had nails driven through it that dug into his flesh every day to try and deny himself. It was a Catholic guy. And as I read that, I just, you know, weak and beggarly. I mean, all day long, you're dealing with this incredible pain. And, you, and you're trying to fix. What he was trying to do is he was trying to, to fix a spiritual issue. But he's trying to do it with the flesh. He can't do it. That's what Paul is saying here. He's saying, look, those of you who came out of idolatry and those of you who came out of the old covenant system, neither one of you want to turn around and go back into that. You don't want to retreat. You want to go on with Christ. You want to go on in the freedom that, God, that Christ has given you. That's where we're going next. We're going to begin to talk about that. We're going to begin to talk about freedom. This is my invitation to you this morning. I did a devotional on this the other day and Don't major on the minors. That's what they're doing. They're going back into all of these things. You know, when you, when, when you, were, you were in this process and God was bringing you to a point, but now we've come to this point, 
Now let's go on with Christ. That's what Paul's saying. That's what I, I want to encourage you to do. Don't get hung up in the little things. Look at the big things. Look at the life that Christ has for you. Ask yourself the question, what does Jesus have for me to do today? It's not be more religious. It's to be more loving. It's to love your enemies. Let's do that. Let's love our enemies. Husbands, let's love our wives as Christ loved the church. Let's, let's, let's take the gospel to every creature. Let's trust God for everything in our lives. Let's be cheerful givers. Let's, <laughs> let's take all of that stuff that we read in the Bible that we go, oh my goodness, how, let's, let's literally go to work against those, those strongholds in our life, those strongholds of temptation in our life. But let's not do it with the law. Let's do it with the spiritual weapons that God has given to us. Let's fight these battles. Let's wage this war. Let's put on the armor of God. Let's advance the kingdom of God rather than retreating back into the ABCs and one, two, threes that we should have already graduated from. That's what Galatians is all about. Amen? And Father, we love you and thank you for this day. God, help us as we, as we consider what it means to be a follower of Christ. God, that we might say with the Apostle Paul, for me to live is Christ. That, that I'm crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. God, as we, as we bow right now, I just pray, Lord, as we consider dealing with our conscience, dealing with the flesh, and we all deal with it, with sin in our lives, besetting sins, those little, little sins that, that we have that we put up with. Father, I pray that right now you would help us to realize the spiritual weapons and tools that we have to truly have victory over those things to truly walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Help us, Lord, to recognize that and see that in our lives. And thank you, Lord. Thank you for the Holy Spirit's work in all of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you take